Uh, Dr. Pen, sh shall we? Yes. All right. Uh, good morning, Dr. Dato, uh, Dr. and delegates. Good morning and a warm welcome to this uh, online symposium on a Sunday morning. We sincerely appreciate each of you uh, to, for joining us today. Well, today, uh, as you are aware, today's uh, symposium is related to the science of uh, aging reversal, which is a uh, Young plasma conditioning and a cell viability test in a heterochronic paralysis. We have actually organized and conducting symposiums related to this topic since the year 2019. Physically, I mean, a physical symposium before the COVID 19 lockdown, typically in Kuala Lumpur and Penang. And also uh, online webinar ever since the pandemic uh, struck us. Therefore, yes, we are committed into this uh, heterochromic paralysis uh, project. And things has been changes in terms of uh, our advancement in the uh, technology and our approaches throughout the pandemic lockdown. And now we are even, we see an even better potential in its, uh, the potential to expand a uh, human health span. So we have, uh, we are honored to have uh, Dr. Pan as our distinguished speaker today. Dr. Pen, a uh, graduate from NTU, Taiwan uh, National University, and hold a PhD in chemistry from University of Chicago, along with a medical degree later. As many of you are familiar with Dr. Pen's uh, exceptional expertise, so we won't go into further details about his background. Anyway, thank you all for your present support and enthusiasm. Let's make the most of this opportunity to deepen our understanding together. And, uh, Please jot down any, if you have any question during the, this, uh, today's webinar, please jot down your question and we will have a Q&A session after the, the Dr. Pan's uh, sharing stand. And uh, I would like to invite you to turn on your video as well, I mean, to create like a better atmosphere online. Okay? So <laughs> without further ado, let's uh, extend a warm round of applause to Dr. Pan for his, uh, his talk today. Dr. Pan. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Suho, for the kind introduction. And I, again, thank you for the time in the Sunday morning. And uh, we get together online and to try to learn and study some more about the technologies in aging reversal. And of, of which I have been involved for almost uh, 29 years now. Anyway, I was, uh, the title of the, today's talk is uh, Young Plasma Conditioning. And we are going to spend a, a little bit more time and discussing about the stem cell viability test, which is uh, very important uh, for the cell therapy and as, as well as for the, uh, the health uh, span in uh, longevity issues. And the technology is based on uh, a, a hundred year old experiment, which is called heterochronic parabiosis. And like uh, Mr. Lu just said, my background is a little bit uh, awkward. Uh, my original PhD was in uh, physical chemistry. And I, after that, I was recruited uh, by the US government into the medical scientist program in the 1986. So the way I look at the medical problem Maybe a little bit different from most of people who are, are more who practice more classic medicines. And the another thing is uh, by professional, I'm uh, boarded by the American uh, Board of Plastic Surgery. So what we what what we are trying to do is that probably is is a bit more of a surgical approach rather than a medical small molecule medicine type of approach. So uh, that was that, that will be a quick uh, introduction about uh, the way we are going to approach uh, this subject. And these are some of the disclosures, and you can see that we have been around for about uh, 20 years all over the Asia. And in fact, I'm uh, giving this talk in our office in the Shenzhen which is uh, the third largest city in China. And the population here is 23 million. And this is our own new clinic. And we uh, uh, collaborate with the local partner and set up the clinic last year. And we are practicing uh, the plasma conditioning therapy here. 
And the talk, I organized my talk on like as the following is. We talked briefly about the background and the hallmarks of aging. And since most of you are professionals, so we will go through this very quickly. Then we go through again very quickly on the history of the heterochronic power biosis, which I think is still important not to forget all the giants and who let us stand on their shoulders. Then we talk about the clinical application of the heterochronic power biosis and the develop and the young plasma conditioning program. And here we are going to talk to you more about how do you interpret the stem cell viability test. And I think this will be the key uh, element in terms of the success for the uh, practice of uh, young plasma condition. So as you know, I mean, age, aging is uh, uh, improportional to the uh, chronic disease. And I, I think this is, goes without saying and most of people by the after age of 60 is going to have at least one or two chronic disease. And by the age of 80s, then the, the, it's very likely they're going to have a five, six, or even eight chronic disease. So the, the concept of the medicine has been changed dramatically after the population aging has uh, hit many uh, developed uh, societies like a tsunami. So the concept now is not like the traditional medicine, which is increase the lifespan. What is more important now and what most people are eyeing at is more like the uh, increasing the hair span. So in other words, that what people are looking for is more like living healthily without, with as few chronic disease as possible and with as little uh, disabled uh, time before their uh, death, okay? And so that's the concept of the health span rather than the lifespan. So we don't talk about longevity all that much anymore because we see so many people lying in the senior home care uh, facilities and who had a stroke, who had uh, cancer or, or heart failure and lying there for eight or 10 years and before they die. and. I don't think uh, that, that's the life that most of people want. So, so what, we are, what we are trying to address is actually aging related disease. So since this is grow, getting so much attention, so scientists and the doctors all over the world has uh, proposed many, many uh, mechanisms and uh, what's listed on the left side. And I think, most of you, since you are professionals, I'm, I'm sure you are familiar with uh, at least some of these uh, entities. And the, in terms of the logic, the, the uh, causal issues of the, all these uh, mechanisms, you can summarize in many different forms. Uh, and this is one of the interpretation uh, we trying to address the aging related disease. But regardless of uh, the which uh, principles do you believe in? But I think um, uh, as a whole, it's still a very complex and messy situation in terms of our understanding of the aging and the, the chronic disease. So like the Ju Judith uh, Carpini, and she was the one of the uh, first, first lady uh, who proposed the idea about the hallmarks of aging. She always said the word, the dirty nature of biology. And since we are medical doctors, so unfortunately, we are facing the dirty nature of uh, this uh, of related uh, issues. And what makes things worse are the trans in terms of the translation of all the findings in the laboratory to the clinical practice is very, very low based on the most uh, recent FDA uh, data, there are only 8% of all the published and all, uh, proposed uh, clinical trials who finally makes it to the uh, market. So as a basic scientist, which like what I just said in the beginning, I'm a chemist. And in particular, I'm also, a, I'm, I'm actually a physical chemist. So we would like to ask ourselves the first question, 
That is, is there any basic science in aging? In terms of basic science is because it is more repeatable and the, is, is quite different from the uh, biological and the uh, social science. So the first approach we took back in 1994 was looking at the genetic versus epigenetic uh, principles. And what, at that time I was uh, teaching in uh, University of Pennsylvania and the first epigenetic uh, factors we look into is actually is uh, the chewing of the nuts, the effect of chewing nuts on the form and shape of the masseteric muscle, okay? And that was a big, uh, has a very uh, important factor uh, on, in terms of the uh, craniofacial surgery. So, but in terms of the uh, aging related chronic disease, uh, we need to address a little bit different uh, issues. So the first question we asked after we are trying to address uh, the aging issues with a basic science approach is, is the cellular aging or, or the aging itself related is programmed. That means that if you are genetically, uh, you have a, you're, you're going to be, uh, have a long life and that's program. So regardless of what you do, you're going to live for a long time. Or if you have a gene which, which could make you, you have a short life gene. And so it doesn't matter how well you take care of yourself, the cell is going to die anyway. So it's a pretty good experiment that was done by a German group. And what they took in this slide, on the right, right lower quadrant, you can see this OH group. They took the uh, MSC, uh, mesenchymal stem cells from the hip and the, the bone marrow of the hip of, of people over 80 years old. And they put them into a gross media, uh, which is rich in all the, in the standard gross media and try to uh, measure their uh, cumulative uh, population doubling time, okay? So you can see that if in, in some of the cases, the old, eight old cells or the cells from the old people actually out, outgrow the cells from the younger individuals. So this experiment tells us circulating uh, progenitor cells, that's the uh, uh, other way you can look at the stem cell. The levels do not decline with healthy aging. But if you have a trauma or you have a disease process when you were younger, because of the change of the disease on the uh, environment in your body, actually that will eventually lead to decrease in the uh, progenitor cells. So the answer to this question is uh, not entirely. At least we know if you're giving the right cultural media or environment, the old or the, the cells from the old people can actually behave are just as good as the cell from the young counterpart. So the first conclusion we have is aging is at least partly due to the uh, environmental factors. So, I mean, you probably, if you are not familiar with this concept, and I can tell you two things, which is based two very popular concepts in terms of anti-aging are directly related to this concept. One is the, the diet concept. So the calorie restriction and uh, the, 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 all the different uh, Mediterranean diet and the Atkin diets, all these things are actually uh, uh, intervention uh, trying to alter uh, the uh, systemic me menus. So this belongs to an epigenetic approach. And the other one, of course, is the exercise. And the uh, data shown that you know, with adequate among those exercise, you can pro prolong the lifespan and together with you know, other measures such as quit smoking and, uh, and the stress management, things like that. So all those methods, which I just mentioned in the last uh, 15 seconds, shares one common uh, characteristics. That is, they are not very expensive. In fact, many of them are actually free. You can, you can run on the street free, freely, okay? But are very these three issues are usually very difficult to last. So as a result, you can see the 
people on the streets of the America in uh, Europe, the people probably has been uh, doing exercise and dieting uh, since uh, their teen age until they going out. So, and the issue you see this phenomena is because uh, this requires very, very uh, high discipline and it's very difficult for average people or average pe uh, you know, people to uh, manage, okay? So is there any other ways we can do this other than the stress management, other than the exercise, other than the diet, calorie restriction, and things like that? Yes, okay. And I think uh, most of you probably see this uh, news. This was just about 10 days ago on the news, okay? In fact, it's on the May 22nd. So this uh, news is, uh, I think, hit the, um, all the social media very, um, very hard. Huh? So many, of our, at least uh, 10 of my friends has sent me a link uh, to this uh, news. So basically what it says that is that one guy, uh, the guy on the right side and uh, Mr. Johnson, and he has he is a rich people by selling his uh, financing online financing company to some big tycoons. So he get uh, 800 million uh, cash back. Then he's begin to spend about two million dollars he claims uh, every year to retain use usefulness usefulness of his uh, body. So this and this guy has been on the very active in the social media and the very been reported so for many times already. But this time he took one step further. Okay, he asked his son, which is shown on the left side of this picture and to donate blood for him. And what's, what makes it more, even more interesting and, uh, and gets uh, people's attention is this time he actually donated his blood to his father. So, so as a result, this is, is, is like a, a three generation swapping of the, the blood. So has, uh, this one has, has definitely caught the attention of the media. But in fact, this, uh, what the place that did their uh, plasma exchange, it, the concept is not a new one. It's a company. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to say that the company is a bit you know, controversial, but I think it's a very uh, talented and uh, innovative uh, company. And the company called uh, Ambrosio, which is established by a Stanford Medical School graduate. His name is called JC Kamazin. And since two, year 2014, he has been managing to collect blood from the college students in the uh, Silicon Valley area and this resell it uh, to the uh, tycoons in the Silicon Valley area. And the cost for that is about one liter of uh, college student blood and it's going to cost them about $8,000. Uh, that's the price. And uh, the company has been around and I think they are still active active uh, right now. So like all the new technology in medicine, uh, the FDA and the, the, the conservative media and everybody has to come out to say something, safety is number one concern and things like that, just like you can't get on the airplane, okay? So, and this is a comment uh, which I uh, clipped from the, um, uh, the news report. So basically, all, all what it says, uh, I, first thing is uh, frequent donation does have positive effects. Of course, all, otherwise nobody wants to donate blood. A lot, a lot few people will, will, will quit, okay? So the next thing is plasma swapping. The result of plasma swapping in increasing longevity is inconclusive, inconclusive. It doesn't mean it's wrong, okay? It's only say it's not conclusive, okay? And the next thing is, a viable human, is this a viable human treatment? Is not enough, not enough. It doesn't mean nothing, okay? Not enough. The, third, the last thing is to him, the guy, you know, Charles Brenner is a biochemist and in the city of Hope, he says that to he himself is gross evidence free and relatively dangerous. So with all those comments and uh, some supporting uh, comments from the Red Cross, and I want to accept the uh, 
target for today's talk is that we will try to address this, this uh, skeptical and the comments about the plasma uh, swapping or plasma reconditioning and things like that. And we will try to provide more evidence and trying to see whether trying to make these things more conclusive and uh, maybe we can raise the evidence level to convince people who is skeptical about this technology. So the concept of hydrochronic pipelines was started in 1864. That's uh, one and a half, uh, 1.5 century ago. Okay, and it was started in France. Okay, by a guy called uh, Paul Bird, and he's the guy who connect the two animals, two rats, uh, two mice each usually. Okay, uh, uh, one animal and the uh, older animal, and this technology was. Uh, uh, attempted again by the genius uh, surgeon called Alexis Carrell, who was uh, my alma mater in uh, University of Chicago. But the guy who bring the heterochronic power bi biotic, uh, technology for the study of aging is actually in 1957 by Clyde McKay. He is also the guy who begin to study the effect of uh, calorie restriction. So. Uh, this is a name to remember, and, and he is a, a PhD in nutrition, okay? So in one sentence, uh, the heterochronic power bars is uh, experimental technology is the only rapid and visible aging reversal method uh, of today, okay? There are other methods like uh, dieting and exercising and things like that, but the, they all take uh, a long time for you to see the effect. And sometimes you can only see them in terms of the biological, biologically, you cannot see them uh, grossly. I mean, what, what is different is uh, heterochronic power bursts, you can see the animal actually micro, in microscopically uh, just become younger. So what happened is see two animals after they are connected. So they just share the blood because the uh, organs of each animal remains inside of the animal. So the only thing which has been uh, exchanged in between the, uh, the mice or rat is only the blood. And how do you connect the humans? That's the uh, next question. So we are familiar with the Siamese, Siamese uh, twins, but these are usually, they are not heterochronic. So this is not a good example for uh, heterochronic power bars, and that means a uh, different age, okay? So the other, the next one is the pregnancy. So of course, the mother of the fetus is always older than the fetus. So this is the uh, heterochronic power bars, but since the size difference are quite big, so they are, the effect of these, uh, uh, was uh, can be skeptical, and we will talk about it, this uh, later. But this is uh, pregnancy is uh, the most uh, human human model for heterochronic pyrolysis, and we will do some calculation in terms of the effect of the pregnancy on the uh, longevity of the mother uh, in the later part of this talk. Of course, uh, you can get pregnant if you are a lady and if you are still uh, fertile. But if you are not, then you, you probably want to know how can we apply the concept of a heterochronic pyrobiosis separately, okay, without connecting the two person together. So the concept, the intuitive approach is very simple. You just think that the, there must be some good stuff in the young blood and then if you adding some of those young stuff into the old blood, you are going to make the old blood younger. And as the result of the younger blood and the body will become younger. That's the logic behind this. So the, in terms of clinical approach, this is the old animal and a, a young animal and they become older. Then how do you make it? become younger again. And this is the concept behind this uh, approach, which was uh, taken by Alexis Carral uh, back in the early 20th centuries. 
So what he did is that he took a chicken heart and uh, give the chicken heart with uh, broth taken from the you know, chicken embryo. And he was able to keep the chicken heart uh, beating for several decades. And this is the uh, classic experiment of using the uh, heterochronic power biotic uh, principle in terms of organ uh, preservation. So who took this to uh, clinical level is uh, a famous guy called uh, Dr. Paul Nehan. And he was inspired by the uh, Alexis Carroll's uh, experiment. So what he did uh, in some coincidence, uh, he was able to begin to inject the tissue extracts from a tissue lamp and to all these uh, celebrities and which uh, you probably you're all familiar. And what's even more interesting is, is that the technology later become the famous brand called uh, La Prairie, which is uh, you go, if you travel in the airport, you can always see them. And in the early part of the world, uh, there will be the Japan, Japanese. So Pony has started in 1931, and uh, the Japan, they have a company called Lanek and the Milson. They started in the 1970s. So they begin to uh, sell uh, Tissue, uh, tissue extracts from human placentas. And to date, uh, they are still doing the same things. And a lot of people will travel to Nagoya and the, I think it's this very famous clinic called uh, Morishita. And they do a lot of uh, injection of these uh, placenta extracts for longevity and the chronic disease treatment. So all these uh, technologies, they are, not convincing, or probably FDA is still not happy with them, is because uh, they are lacking uh, clinical data. And so I think my personal opinion is that the concept or the practice of heterochronic papers was a uh, was, uh, change, has a paradigm change. And that was back in the uh, 2016. A group in Berkeley uh, led by uh, Irina Conboy and uh, his husband, Michael Conboy, they did an experiment, okay? So what they do is this. They, in, instead of connecting the two animals together, they are just drawing blood from the old animal and inject it into the young animal and vice versa. So originally, during the experiment, they were expecting that since you're only injecting a small part of the blood, just say one tenth of the whole uh, blood. So they're expecting the young animal will get a little bit older and the old animal will become much younger because old animal has little uh, useful substance. And if you give 10% of the young animals useful substance, then that can compose a big substantial part of the old plasma. But the experimental results were quite uh, surprising. That was the young animal, it did not get a little bit older. The, the young animal actually gets much older instead of uh, getting a little bit older. And the old animal did, get, did not get much younger. The old animal only get a little younger. And this seems to be a, a strat, uh, tragic, uh, very uh, bad result for whoever believes in uh, the useful material. So what uh, the convoy find is instead of the, the young, the concept of young people has more useful substance, it's actually the, we should switch the concept to uh, the old people has a lot of old substances and the, of the young substance and the useful substance the aging substance actually dominant, do, is, more, is more dominant. So this is like uh, when you are driving and if you have the uh, brake uh, step down, then it doesn't matter how much uh, gas you are put pressing, the car is not going to move. So with this uh, new observation and the convoy quickly uh, working with the a pioneer guy in 
uh, had in plasma pharesis. Uh, his name is called Dr. Dobry Kipro. He's from Yugoslavia and the practice uh, uh, the, this uh, type of uh, uh, technology in, in the Bay Area right now. So the two people get together and introduce the concept of using the uh, TPE machine to remove the bad sub substance and, re and to replace the removed substance with the uh, FFP, fresh frozen plasma, or with the 5% albumin and uh, with a certain percentage of the IVIG. And the, the team uh, keep on working on this and uh, eventually, they were able to did a small uh, clinical trial of, uh, I, I think, a, a dozen uh, patients. And they were able to see significant in decrease in terms of the C-reactive protein and uh, other uh, indexes in the blood. The issues is then require uh, doing weekly uh, plasma pharesis for say like six or 10 times and before they uh, stretch the uh, time intervals. So the other uh, company, uh, which is called Griffos, which is the, one of the largest uh, company for uh, human plasma products. And the group uh, is more disease focused. So they use the uh, similar technology to address the Alzheimer's disease. So the group uh, took the group about uh, 10 years and uh, to complete a, a level 3A a clinical trial. And the results show that if for Alzheimer's people, the MMSE score, that, that's the score very commonly used to address the severity of the deterioration of the Alzheimer's disease. The rate of the uh, decrease in terms of MMSE score will be decreased by 70% if you are treated with this uh, uh, TPE technology, therapeutic plasma exchange technology. So on the X axis, you can see all these uh, little triangles. So these, each triangle in the beginning is one week apart. So you need to do a full volume TPE uh, consecutively for six times. Then you can, you can do this become like every several weeks of low volume plasma exchange and to gain this type of results. And with that data, the, the group begin to set up um, Alzheimer treatment centers uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, this one shows their centers, the, their first center in the Barcelona, Spain, okay? And the center is uh, designated for the treatment of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So what we can summarize what we know about the clinical application of uh, petrochronic pyrobiosis from Paul Nienhen, the Japanese uh, placenta extract, and uh, to various form of uh, plasma pharesis. So we have been uh, involved in regenerative medicine for a long time. But we got into this uh, plasma-related anti-aging methods uh, in the uh, year 2016. At that time, by coincidence, I was a, I was bring, brought to uh, Phnom Penh, which is the capital of uh, Cambodia, to address some health issues to one of the generals in that country. And at that time, we found that we were surprised to find that uh, Cambodia is, has the youngest uh, population in the world because of the red uh, uh, Khmer regions uh, uh, years. So with these so many young blood available to us, so we quickly uh, get into the concept of using, trying thinking about uh, out uh, perform an uh, ambrosius approach by using 15-year-old uh, fresh frozen plasma. So that was uh, our original thinking in 2016. So at that time, uh, the convoy published their landmark paper about the uh, aging substance uh, dominant paper. So it's not really too hard for us to 
incorporate the concept of TPE into our, our 15 year of FFP concept. So what is that our first designs was trying to use the TPE machine to remove the aging substance and, and then replace them with uh, fresh frozen plasma of the 15 years old. I mean, that, that was the ideal situation and that was what we were planning to do, okay? So this is the first uh, uh, procedure which was done in uh, my clinic in Taiwan. Okay, this is you, again you can see this one of the TPE machines, and this is one of the, uh, our, our, our patients. And you can see this is a technician, and you have two nurses there, and uh, everybody is quite busy trying to do this. Okay, so we quickly find out that uh, to perform the TPE machine, the first thing is that is labor intensive. Second thing is that I mean, the patient is actually very frightened during the procedure because he he later tell me is he, he's not very comfortable of seeing his blood circulating outside of his body and things like that. So for psychological issues and for uh, financial issues, and the, the most important of all, the TPO is uh, still has a low risk, some low risk of uh, stroke uh, the, for complication. So we decided to back down on this approach. So as a chemist, we quickly redesigned the process of a hetero clinical uh, heterochronic pyrolysis. So instead of using the TPE machine, we decided to use the bloodletting. Since the plasma, the blood volume in the human is, is appro approximately uh, the body weight divided by 13, then we, and the blood bank allows us to remove uh, 500 cc of blood each time. So by simple calculation, I think by doing bloodletting, should be able to remove at least uh, five to 10% of the bad substance in the blood. And the other uh, modification is that instead of using the FFP of 15 year old, we begin to using our, our uh, knowledge about hormone, about cytokines and the artificial plasma replacement fluid. And we to use this to design our formula for the replacement of the removed uh, human blood. So we named this uh, intermittent plasma conditioning because this is by uh, definition is really not a plasma exchange. And, and we don't use this uh, continuously. We do uh, the conditioning on a, a bi-weekly basis. So at that time, the Stanford professor called Tony Whiskeray, and he did a very uh, comprehensive study about the proteins in the, in the blood of different age. So what he studied is about 7,000 uh, proteins in about 3,000 subjects. Now with his study, he was able to classify the proteins in the plasma into four categories that are the uh, common factors means that the concentration between the young and the old are essentially the same. The adolescent factors, that's uh, the hormones related to the adolescents. Most of them are uh, sex hormones. The other one is the beneficial factors, which uh, decrease with age. And uh, lastly, the harmful factors, which begin to accumulate after age of around 40. And that was uh, his finding and the, although there are 3,000 proteins in the plasma, and then he find out that the ca uh, candidates for this uh, plasma conditioning is really not that many. So with his data, and we are able to design uh, a formula using a machine to compound it uh, to become our um, anti-aging plasma replacement. With that, uh, between the year 18, uh, 2018, the third quarter of 2018, until the first quarter of 2020, we performed about 200 sessions, 200 plus sessions in Taiwan and the Malaysia and Penang, uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur and Penang. And the, we, we don't do this uh, all that smoothly. Uh, frequently, we do encounter allergies and uh, sometimes uh, we have patients become anemic, 
And we also have one incidence of our cytokine storms. So the interesting part is uh, we, after the event of cytokine storm, we were almost ready to quit this project. But one thing which is very important is uh, all these customers, although despite all these uh, allergic reactions and even the cytokine storms, and the customers actually give us uh, very positive feedbacks. So we re-examine what we have done and we find out we are missing one important piece of all with all this program like the others. That is, we are lacking a treatment guideline. And it's very interesting in uh, 2020, and we have one uh, major investor become interested in our technology and practice. And he also requests us to begin to provide some hard data. And we use the investor's blood to perform the first plasma, plasma uh, examinations uh, in the April 17th of 2020. And this was uh, his result. Okay, now let me explain this uh, plasma technology, uh, plasma diagnostic technology, or we can you can also call it uh, stem cell viability testing uh, in more details with this figure. So on the x axis, what you see the percentage is the percentage of the human plasma. So the uh, on the right hand side, hundred percent means that uh, the hundred percent human plasma from the subject. And we were giving a certain number, say like uh, 1,000 uh, stem cell. And uh, the stem cell will be cultured by using 100% plasma. And we will keep count the number of the stem cells survived uh, after one week. And as you can see on this figure, basically uh, all of the stem cell died up in the human plus 100% human plasma in one week. But if we begin to add in some formulations, we compounded based on our Tony, Tony Whiskeray's data. And the, you can see after we compounded with 65% uh, of, of the um, human plasma and 30, 35% of the formulation, you can see this mixture will be able to maintain the survival of the original stem cells. And keep on doing so, we find uh, an interesting phenomena. That is, with our formula and the, the combination of the, our formula with the human plasma, you can actually improve, you have room to improve the survival rate of the stem, stem cells by hundreds and sometimes even up to a thousand times. And with this uh, observation, we quickly uh, repeated uh, after the test for each indiv individual sessions. So with this, for these individuals, these are the tests from the April 29th and uh, one month later. So in between, this patient has two sessions of the plasma conditioning. And you can see, the viability of the stem cell begin to increase very significantly. So the next question will be, uh, how long will this uh, observation last? So what we did is, after we did two sessions on the, for the plasma uh, conditioning, then we waited for 10 weeks. Then we make another adjustment, uh, another measurement. Then we can see that the, improvement of the stem cell viability in the human plasma or these this, uh, synergistic uh, graphics actually can maintain quite well. And by keep on doing so, you can come up with a graphic like this. So on the X axis are the time and the green circles are the time he got the treatment. So with six treatment, with actually five treatment, the viability of the stem cell rises from 7% to uh, 837%. Per 
And that is an increase of 120 times. And what's even more interesting is, despite uh, of the changes in the plasma diagnostics, the patient's uh, EGFR, and this is shown in the gray dots, okay? That was the original reason he came to us because of the uh, deterioration of the EGFR. And this triangular after uh, the EGFR after he, he, he got the uh, plasma conditioning. And the, you can see the EGFR immediately stab stabilized after the uh, couple of uh, plasma conditioning sessions. And the guy also began to grow out uh, black hairs. And what's more interesting is that uh, the guy come back in about uh, three months later, and you can see the stem cell viability actually dropped to about half from the maximum. So in other words, uh, the effect of the plasma conditioning after you reach the 120 times were able to maintain for you know, about three months. So, and you can keep on doing this type of things. You can see the stem cell viability testing results uh, the correlation uh, with the uh, plasma conditioning is extremely well. And these are the uh, EGFR data, uh, keep, but keep on doing so. So what we can uh, conclude here is that are the following. One is uh, the O blood does not support the uh, MSC. And the condition takes three to six sessions. And the although the plasma condition in the Percentage is probably 10, 15%. But the increase in the stem cell viability is by multiple times. Okay. So over the results, of course, is patient de dependent. But to our experience, most of the patients, up to 90% of the patients, after the did three to six treatments, we, you can definitely observe the increase in of the stem cell viability in the plasma of the patient. So since we all the material we use are not small molecule drugs, not pharmacological uh, substances. So we name this as a biochemical type of plasma conditioning. That means that all the material we use, like nutrients, hormones, and uh, cytokines, all of these uh, chemicals are existing in the patient's uh, human body. And we are just using these uh, biochemical reagents to uh, adjust uh, or titrate uh, their concentrations to reach these results. So the, to summarize what we see on, on the previous example, you can see the patients, uh, if, if you take patient's plasma and give it to a hundred stem cells. After seven days, you only have original only have three cells which survived, and the after several sessions of this, the survival rate become you give give it to a hundred um, stem cells. The survival rate you, the stem cell actually can grow to three hundred sixty. And six months later, and the stem cells still the effect of the plasma conditioning on the plasma and still remains. So I think most of you are, are doctors and you, you are aware of that most of the medication, the half-life or the uh, are, are quite slow from hours to days at most. So we are thinking by what we are doing uh, is actually we are creating an epigenetic type of uh, vaccine for aging, okay? So I, I know some of you do practice uh, albumin therapy for anti-aging. So let me see, we did do an experiment for using the albumin and uh, use that to compare to our data. So on the left is the result of the uh, intermittent uh, plasma condition, IPC. On the right is we do the same experiment using the uh, albumin, okay? So you can see that if you with hundred percent albumin, pure albumin, the survival rate of the uh, stem cell is uh, is a big zero. Okay, and you need to 
keep on uh, diluting the plasma with our formula uh, to almost uh, one third, two thirds before you can see them to increase. And you can also see the, the dot on the 10 right here is actually the dot on the left here. So you can see the uh, albumin curve actually is goes down like this, and which is very different from the synergistic effect we can create with human plasma and the uh, plasma conditioning formulations. So with this finding, we know you cannot use only plus uh, albumin to accomplish this type of results. So in conclusion, plasma is actually the very important for the functional stem cells and the conditional plasma is very important for repair capacity because it's, it is important for with, with the stem cells. So those were preliminary uh, preparations before we be, to before we engineer a more uh, uh, clinical program. So we now separate the practice into two phases. One is the intense phase and the other one is the maintenance phase. So for the intense phase, you do it every two weeks and you do it three times. So with this, you will exchange about four, 450 cc of uh, plasma. And after that, you can, uh, ex you can change the interval of the plus in between the plasma conditioning from uh, three months to six months. And the volume can also decrease a little bit if you think, if you think the per person is doing well and uh, you don't need to do uh, 150 cc plasma conditioning. In between, we do sometimes give uh, patients some hormonal or cytokine supplementation uh, on a, a, a short basis. Basically, we only give them say for one week or two weeks. So uh, Mr. Lu had, had asked me to go into more details about the uh, report we will give out, send out from the plasma diagnosis uh, uh, test. So this is the report of uh, from cover to cover uh, interpretation, okay? The interpretation. So the first thing is the outline, then you, you see the basic data on the patient. And this is the gross appearance of uh, patient's uh, blood. Then you can see on the right, you can see some of the related uh, anti-aging related index, which we do look at for, for the plasma uh, conditioning. Basically, we look at the reticular cyclone. This is uh, based on the, we, we want to use this to look at the uh, bone marrow function. As CRP, you know, is uh, for uh, inflammation, inflammations. IGF-1 is for the growth factor. Uh, EGFR is the renal function and the uh, hematocrit, that's to uh, prevent uh, anemia. Then after that, you will see this uh, graphic on the left side. So th there are three colored color dots here. So the one right here normalized uh, to one is the original uh, number of the stem cell given to, to the human plasma. So the survival rate will be of the 100% human plasma will be B prime divided by B. So that, that's how you get the uh, stem cell viability. So then we look at the right side, then we dilute the plasma by 50% without adding any formulations. If you can, uh, in this, like the, in this case, you can see the viability of the stem cells rises from B prime to C. So this is the indication that the patient's plasma is toxic to the uh, stem cells. And if you uh, dilute the plasma with 50% of formulation, then you can see the stem cell viability has room to grow uh, 1.5 to 2.5, okay? So that, that, that is the aim of the target for the plasma conditioning. And this is how you see the data. And on the right side, these are the biochemical reagents. And of course, all of them are uh, pharmacologically uh, licensed, uh, GMP grade, since then, and legal approved by the uh, local FDA. 
And you, these are the reagents and uh, uh, we use to compound the uh, the plasma uh, the artificial plasma replacement fluid. And these are these are the photos from the stem cell culture. And these are the comments. And this is a signature by me after I reviewed it. So we and the if the patient uh, has has done this for several times, then we do plot the stem cell viability against the treatment for for the client. Okay. And we also plot the plasma toxicity uh, as well. And the rest of the report are just standard uh, uh, dictionaries and the, the references, okay? So now I'll quickly show you some uh, clinical uh, examples. And these are uh, quite uh, complete, complete and interesting cases. So this is a guy uh, who has been getting this uh, plasma conditioning therapy in our clinics, type A clinic for about two years now, two or three years, I don't know. And originally he had a stroke and uh, he can't walk at all. And he's recovered now and he can play tennis, okay? So and we have a patient coming in for a diabetic uh, coronary kidney, kidney disease and uh, she got this therapy and very quickly in, about five months, the EGF I was able to improve by about 15%. And this is a 95 years old lady. And uh, she's, she was our one of our original patients. And you can see the results was very good. You, the stem cell survival rate was, was improved dramatically with this uh, plasma conditioning. And uh, she, she also grew out some uh, black hair right here. And th this part, the end of this, the hair is actually from the uh, dying of the, 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 the hair. So, and there are many, many more clinical examples. And I think because of time, I'm, I don't, we, we won't, won't in, go into details. So um, what we know about this, I want to summarize uh, what we know about the uh, hydrochronic plasma conditioning uh, technology right now. Basically, the hydrochronic papacy was an animal experiment. And for 100 years, people are trying to uh, translate this technology into uh, clinical uh, aging reversal uh, practice, okay? And to the best of our understanding right now, there are four ways you can do this. So the first way is uh, the most natural way. And how you do it is you can, you can remove the aging substance by menstruations and the, you can add in the useful uh, substance by, uh, add, by getting pregnant, okay? And the other way is a biological way. And you can, you can, this is what the Ambrosia, the American company does. You can do blood dating and uh, replace them with FFP. And the physical way are uh, people who practice uh, TPE, plasmapheresis. You can remove the toxic substance or by using the machine. And again, you can use the use uh, different uh, plasma replacement products. And what we are doing is we use uh, blood dating and the some formulation to remove the aging substance and uh, we replace them with a, a proprietary uh, combination of biochemical nutrients and the reagents. And there are pros cons for different approach. And the natural way, the pregnancy way is, is free, but is most expensive in the long run. And the biological way is, uh, has, is lim limited by its supply. And the physical way of removing the uh, aging substance by the machine, I think is a bit dangerous. Uh, the complicated rate is uh, a, little bit, a little bit high for our like, and the, the psychological uh, effect and the, the cost of the machine and the HR issue call and, and the, the labels are quite high. And, Another showback for this is uh, the effects actually only lasted for about you know, less than a month. And the lastly, uh, our method has uh, some uh, advantage because it's a mild uh, and a long lasting procedure. But the setback is that it requires multiple clinical visits 
And the effect is not as fast as the physical way of, of doing this. And the, the results are progressive, okay? And some of you may be interested in get want to know some clinical trial data. And you are all familiar with the classification of the level of uh, evidence in this graph. And at the lowest level, that's based on the case uh, report, you, you can see the various effect of the plasma conditioning on our method. So most of the clients uh, become more energetic and they don't get catch cold. And the control of the diabetic usually gets much better and their cognitive function sometimes can improve dramatically. We had just one case whose uh, MMSE score was like uh, 11 or 12 out of 15. And by doing this uh, plasma conditioning three times in a week, because the patient flew in from Singapore and both couple improved from uh, uh, 12 uh, to uh, 15 out of 15, uh, just after three sessions. And the renal function, especially for diabetic chronic renal disease, we can definitely improve them. And the, some of the cancer patients coming in after uh, chemo and or major surgical resections. And by getting this, uh, they will uh, become much healthier and uh, they also become much more energetic. And in some extreme cases, they were able to uh, extend their uh, survival uh, lifespan uh, for up to an year for stage four pancreatic cancers. And these are uh, next level of evidence that shows the effect on the uh, renal disease. And these are small trial on the immune functions and the thymus function using similar technologies. And the, this is the uh, 3A uh, data on Alzheimer. And the number of the patients in this study is about 500. Okay. But with all those uh, small care, scale clinical trials, I think you probably all understood, it is very difficult to conduct an anti-aging uh, clinical trial, trial because of the nature of this uh, issue, just like in plastic surgery, it's very difficult to conduct a clinical trial because you cannot do uh, a double uh, a facelift on one side and, the, and leave the other side untouched and the patient uh, the control group will not stand this, okay? So, but I think the most important clinical trial data, which is the uh, antidote uh, re retrospective study on the effect of the pregnancy on the mother. Like what I just said in the beginning, the mother is usually, you know, at least say like 20 to 45 years old, older than the fetus. And the only, and the, they were connected uh, for say like 10 months. And especially for the last three months of the pregnancy, the, the, the fetus grow to a significant size that matches about uh, one thirties or twenties of the weight of the mother. So pregnancy is a very good uh, clinical uh, trial of the uh, effect of heterochronic parabasis on longevity. And the data, data here shows if the patient, the mother, has uh, her last pregnancy at age of 45, that's shown on the dash line, and the probability of her to live to age of 80 is 50% higher than the mother who has the last pregnancy of age 35, because the effect of heterochronic pyrolysis is much bigger for the first, in the uh, first prior case as compared to the latter case. There are also many potential applications and the, which is being proposed by Thomas Randall, who is responsible for the resurrection of this uh, century old technology in the studies of anti-aging. And there are also different clinical trials of using different uh, plasma formulations in Alzheimer's disease, in Parkinson's disease, and things like that. And the, 
we think within three or four years, we should have some uh, uh, medication, uh, uh, IV infusions, uh, which, which uh, has the effect of uh, uh, reversing some chronic disease approved by the FDA. So the plasma condition therapy, you can use this independently to activate the resident stem cells. And you can also use this uh, as a pretreatment before you do, do the cell therapy, okay? And I think this is the position uh, you can consider for clinicians to incorporate this uh, technology into your practice. So, because if you infuse the stem cells uh, without the plasma conditioning, sometimes you will go, run into a situation like the, the left-hand side. That means that you bought 100 stem cells infused into a body, but only three of them survived. And unfortunately, this is most, most, most of the time, this is the case. And what is even worse is that the 97 cells which don't survive actually will bring a lot of free radicals and the toxic substance and release them into the bloodstream. So a lot of the patient who, who doesn't feel quite well or have a feverish response is actually due to the death of the uh, stem cells in, infused. So with our technology and the plasma uh, and the stem cell viability testing, you can find the best window to perform the stem cell transplantation and the patient will get much better response with, a less, with less dosage, okay? So the, in the future, and we always we are expanding this type of technology into uh, intravascular stem cells. Okay, and these are two types. One is the EPC, the other one are the NK cells, and we should be able to offer this type of plasma conditioning by the end of this year. And we are also uh, begin to bring in more uh, biochemical reagents and trying to uh, extend the uh, efficacy of the therapy. And we also set up uh, different uh, plasma uh, conditioning laboratory and the clinics in the China and the Asian area. And we are very open to collaborate with uh, people in, uh, in every city and the uh, if you are interested, you please uh, contact us. And this is our, our plan uh, for 2023. And, and this is, uh, we are trying to, interest in setting up a center in Jakarta, Ho Chi, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur. This one is coming up very soon. And from Penn, Bangkok. And the, these are the cities in China and uh, we are also in the talk of setting up a, our flagship center in uh, Tokyo, in the Omoto Santo area. This, uh, there is a, a very important hurd hurdle we need to overcome in performing the plasma conditioning. It's because of the human error, because these technicians who is required to perform such a uh, uh, program is very high. So with that in, in mind, we cooperate with uh, MIH company in Japan. We already developed some uh, automated uh, plasma uh, conditioning and the compounding device and who are able to do the uh, test, plasma, uh, the stem cell viability test and the compounding the uh, artificial fluid for the plasma conditioning automatically uh, to reduce the uh, probability of human of error. So this is what we do now. Uh, basically, we draw the blood from the patient and we give it to the machine. The machine will come up with a report, and the report after approved by the doctor and the will give it to the pharmacist, and the pharmacy will will bring the uh, chemical the the drugs and the IV FDA approved uh, fluid into the machine and the machine will compound the uh, artificial plasma replacement fluid for that individual. Okay. So stem cell dysfunction 
is the cause of aging. And the, the O plasma is definitely not, not good for the stem cell function. So uh, intermittent plasma condition technology can improve the stem cell in the old plasma. And that's the reason, and the results can last for several months. And that's the reason we think uh, hydrocolonic plus parabiosis uh, based uh, anti-aging plasma conditioning is the way to go for the uh, and for the anti-aging market in the future. So this is, uh, we are coming to the end of this uh, talk and let me just tell you a little bit uh, more about some of the new things which is coming up. So this is an experiment done by the uh, Columbia group. And uh, what they do is that they are able to using the uh, injured tissue, uh, injured organ, uh, in, in this case is the injured uh, pig, lung of the pig and it connected to the uh, another pig, okay? And you can see that the injured lung can recover in about 36 hours, okay? And this type of technology is called uh, cross-circulation, organ, re re organ restoration technology. And we are also working on this and we are using a, a rat model and we are working on this uh, using the, uh, uh, the AKI uh, animal model. And we can see that the kidney the injured kidney of the AKI uh, can be improved very quickly. And what comes to, uh, is almost like a totally surprise is this patient, this patient I show you, show you we discussed a lot uh, previously during the talk, is actually a 93 uh, or four years old guy. Interesting is, this guy uh, went to stay to visit his uh, uh, his daughter and his son-in-law, and he had uh, suffered a fall in the AKI, and the kidney function was gone. And for his age, he was 95 years old, and the, in one month, his renal function was fully recovered. Yeah, and because this person has been getting this, uh, our plasma conditioning program for two years. And I think the family is totally uh, grateful about, uh, about this. So these are the machines we are uh, designing. And hopefully in the future, we'll be able to use this machine to <coughs> restore uh, the function of various organs. And Professor Oka was my mentor in the Department of Chemistry at University of Chicago. And he always tell us this, uh, trying to just go ahead with what you think is right. And in the beginning, people is, is going to think it's impossible. And after you get some results and people will become skeptical. And, and once your results has uh, gained popularities, and then the people will, think, will say that it was obvious. And I think we are at the stage of between the skeptical and the obvious. And based on uh, Dr. Oka's opinion, uh, the first three years, the first three years has passed and we are trying to use the next uh, few decades uh, to establish the efficacy and the evidence and the clinical data on the uh, hydroponic plasma uh, conditioning uh, technology. And with that, I thank you for your time and the listening. I'm open for questions now. Thank you, Dr. Pan. I think today's uh, sharing and uh, presentation is wonderful and very comprehensive. Uh, should we go for a, a two minutes break, Dr. Pan, or should we just carry it ahead? Yeah. Okay, then I think about it. we'll just go carry, carry, carry uh, ahead. So now we enter the Q&A session. So for any audience that uh, would like to raise any question, any query, uh, please take a thing, think about it and uh, you can, you can the, 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 the floor is open now. You can just uh, unmute yourself, unmute your, your mic. Um, the, the mic, I think is on the left lower hand, I think. I'm, I'm not sure. Right. Dr. Nora, uh, Dr. Amin, or oh, Alice. 
Um, what? Who's asking first? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, 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 well, I'm Dr. Nora. I just want to ask um, uh, the the stem cells that you actually advise to use. Is there a particular amount? Because you said the lower the better. Because generally, what's been uh, advised to use is about 100 million to even up to 200 million per session, and depending yeah. on the ability of the patient to purchase it. But what is I, your I advice? If the patient has already gone through the conditioning, plasma conditioning, then you what is the amount the, that we use? I used to use 100 million in the beginning, okay? And with this technology coming up, I mean, I'm using less than this. Sometimes I use that five million now, and I think I think I can, and the patient feel good and no side effects. Yeah, you can go go as low as five million, or if you want, you can try one million. But it, it's really depends on the result of the uh, stem cell viability test. If the patient can grow the stem cell, you only you, you all you need to do is give a little bit. And they can grow, you know, hundred times more more stem cells, and these stem cells, because these are MSCs, so the size of these MSCs are about 40 microns, and since the capital of the lung is about eight microns, so those MSC infused will 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 be uh, uh in the lung will be stuck in the lung, and uh, these MSC if they they survive. They will be send out signals, serial signals based on what they detect in the bloodstream. So uh, this is the way we practice uh, stem cell uh, therapy now. We just use less and less uh, stem cells. And for the patients, they are happy because stem cells are quite expensive and they are willing to translate, transfer their budget for the stem cell therapy and into for the uh, plasma conditioning. And the most of the time, actually they feel uh, pretty comfortable about this type of uh, arrangement. Okay, so Dr. Pan, so I'd like to repeat what you've just said in your yeah. lecture. Ideally, we do conditioning plasma transfusion at least about three or six times before you yes. actually start the stem cells, the combined stem cells. Yes. And initially you can do, depending on time constraint, they can even do like every other day, three times a week, or if not, you yes. do twice a week. Yes. Uh -huh. And on the six, on the six, uh, after the sixth session, then you, you um, well, you put in the stem cells for better results. Yes. Yes. And But when do we do the test to assess the improvement in the stem cells um, once it's ejected? I mean, at the beginning of when you do the plasma or when you actually infusing the stem cells and then to do it we again do the, three months later? Mm, we do the plasma, uh, the stem cell viability test before the plasma conditioning and the two weeks after the plasma conditioning before the stem cell infusion. Okay, so basically we do the stem cell viability test first, then we do the plasma conditioning and wait for two weeks, then we repeat the stem cell viability test again. So that can document the improve, improvement of the human plasma in terms of the stem cell viability. And after that, since the stem cell already, the viability already improved, then you can inf infuse the stem cell into the the van. After you infuse the stem cells, um, mm -hmm. do you advise also to do the stem cells viability after six months to see how much is uh, viable at that stage before you say you want to repeat another dose of stem cells? The, the stem cell viability test, what we are doing is a test for the quality of the plasma. So you can do, so basically we are do, testing the plasma, the, the quality and the bioactivity and the toxicity of the plasma 
with respect to a certain uh, type of stem cells, okay? So after you infuse the stem cells, it's really, I mean, you can, you can do another plasma uh, viability, uh, stem cell viability test in maybe three months. That's what we usually do, three months interval for, for, mm -hmm. plasma, for stem cell viability test. Say in a person who wants to stay young, forever young. Mm -hmm. So what's the uh, number of times a patient should have stem cells annually? How many times a year? It depends on the uh, it, it depends on the stem cell viability test. If the stem cell can grow in the plasma, they only need to do it say annually, or sometimes they, they don't even have to, to do the stem cells. The stem, the, once the quality of the plasma improve, the, all the stem cell original, the, we call it re resident stem cells in the, each organ will become deactivated. But it's really up to, up to different physicians and the different patients' situation. So it's no one answer for for this question, yeah. My advice is that you do you do have to do stem cell viability test uh, before each stem cell infusions, and I think that's what patients like to see, yeah. Thank you for the answer. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Nora. Uh, is there any other audience here like to have another questions? Uh, good morning, Dr. Pan. Um, yes. I'm from Surabaya, Indonesia. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. So um, we already received about the um, regulatory requirement requirements. And um, it's written that the active ingredients of these products will keep as a secret. So yeah, uh, to keep the intellectual and competitiveness for this um, industrial. So I want to mm -hmm. ask in Indonesia, if you want to open a clinic for this, we all we have to receive the uh, approval from the government and we have uh, mm -hmm. like a Indonesian doctors association and we also have mm -hmm. to receive the approval from them. So uh, it means mm -hmm. so we so they have to know about the ingredients, about the mm -hmm. um, bioactive from this product. So what's, mm -hmm. the, what's the solution of this? So it's, it's pretty simple because if you want to do a clinical trial on this, you need to, basically this is uh, the reason I try to tell you about the, what Columbia University did for the organ restoration. They are uh, cost, uh, the, xenogenic uh, cause uh, circulation because you can create a formula X, okay? That's the, F, um, uh, the US FDA approach because so many situations like this because you, each people has a new uh, formulations. So you can use a combo uh, combination of the materials and the giving it a code, say like you know, 601A3, things like that. And, and you can apply for a new drug testing with this type of approach, yeah. Is that clear? Okay, thank you so much, Dr. for the answer. I don't, I don't know about the situation in Indonesia, I'm sorry, yeah. But I would be happy to learn more about it, yeah. So um, it means that we just do the clinical trial for the products, right, in Indonesia? Yeah, yeah, it, mm, that's correct. Okay, Just thank you do so a new trial. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor, for the answer. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, anyway, the first time I think I talk, we have an audience from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Right. Dr. Pan, can I ask you a question? Of course. Yeah, Dr. I mean, I'm using Dr. Nora's phone here. I um, I don't know whether it's related or not. It is uh, regarding the question of uh, my patient, whether you can detect spike protein in your circulation. And if it is possible, then uh, through the 
uh, what you call this uh, plasma paresis for removal and then uh, doing doing your plasma reconditioning does it have any effect at all no you can do many things because what, what, what we are talking about today is i mean i i think every doctor has a secret uh, technology and the ingredients and that's uh, fully respected so what we are trying to do is are uh, we providing a stem cell viability test okay so right now we're going to do we are, we are using the uh, extravascular stem cell and we are going to offer intravascular stem cell viability test by the end of this year so you can using our technology as a system for you and incorporate it into your program, which you think is good. And because every place is different, because in China, in China where I am right now, the customer seems be worrying about removing blood more than go on the machine. I'm not sure about that. And maybe due to how there's a marketing skill or something like that. But anyway, every place is different. And you, that's what I say, there are four approaches. One is the, the natural approach. And then, of course, that's not related to the doctor. And then you can do the FFP, the biological approach. You can combine it with the physical approach with the machine. And you can also using our formulations. And, but it doesn't matter how you approach this. You know I mean, I think our stem cell viability test is going to give, give you a very good support and to convince your customer about what you do. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Hi, Dr. Penn, it's Alice. Hi, Alice. Uh, a quick question, you know, I think, uh, you know, I've been sort of following you with your work for many, many years. I think this is just, um, I think another step in an exciting uh, sort of uh, evolution or improvement with the biochemical test that you're able to do. So now if you are, you know, so sort of supplying the plasma to individual, uh, let's say clinics or collaborators. So is that a lab or something that, you know, they're going to establish so that these people, because whatever data that you have, uh, it's quite unique. I think I don't think every uh, lab will be able to produce the kind of a test that you're able to, uh, you know, um, how's it, uh, uh, comment on. So, is that going to be a lab established in, in in Kuala Lumpur or something that we are going to be able to send the the blood, you know, patient's blood for interpretation and all that? Yeah, basically, what we do now is this: the in a clinic. The, in our collaborate in the clinic we collaborate with, you can do the. We, we just send our technicians. We call it satellite clinic, the technician from the satellite clinic to collect the blood, and they will process the plasma in the satellite lab. Then we send it to a regional lab. So in Kuala Lumpur, we are setting up the regional lab, which can do the uh, stem cell viability test. Okay. But the data interpretation and the, the final compounding calculations that's centralized. Is that clear? Okay. Okay. Centralized. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the, the the calculation part and the interpretation because it's so is is centralized. So the the interpretation should be it it, it should be uh in good hands. Yeah. Okay. So centralized means the blood uh sent to Taiwan. Or it's going to no, be the you do the test in the local. You, okay. you can send your plasma. Say you can process in your. You say for example, you want to do it in your clinic. Just call us. We send somebody to come and okay. pick up the the stem cell. Yeah, pick okay. up the plasma and, and go do do the test. So the final formulation is centrally means it's going to be you will be the one looking through all the reports and then formulate a certain. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, the plasma. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm just. I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah. I'm just overseeing this. And make sure that. I mean, just. I would be the co-signer of all the results. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Sure.
Thank you, Dr. Alice. Yes, our lab in KL will be opening soon and hopefully can be operated in the month uh, of July. Yeah, I'll update uh, every one of you. So uh, do we still have any other questions? Otherwise, uh, we're going to end the, uh, the, the Q&A session. Dr. Pan, can I ask again uh, about the, uh, you mentioned about the, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you to touch on the, your experience on the cytokine storm. Uh, what was it like and is there any anticipation as to the possible patient and the early development of the cytokine storm? Yeah, because uh, when we, we, we had one case of, one suspicious case of about that, yeah. yeah <laughs> and the, at that time, uh, we, we, have, we don't have that much knowledge about it. But, but since, of the, since the COVID-19, it's so much in the in the beginning of COVID nineteen. There are so many cytokine storms. So I mean, we, we it's basically we are feeling more comfortable about the type of situation. But well, but even even the, we can manage the cytokine storm. You know, we you know current you no know, hydration since that all those therapies. But we our formulation has has uh, going to fourth generation now. So the risk of allergy. Uh, has decreased by, by about 10 times. And the, we have not seen any cytokine storm anymore. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, just now, if I, if, I get, if I get it right, in terms of the maintenance therapy, the recommendation of the intermittent injection of uh, interleukin, uh, how is that being done? Okay, so if you uh, want to go into maintenance therapy, because some of the components in the in the uh, plasma, the, the artificial fluid is too short. So you can do some uh, hormone and the, some cytokine combinations uh, doing a subcut subcutaneous injections, like small shots. Yeah, we can, we, we also are compounding those material for you. But that is optional. Uh, yeah, that's optional. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, well. Before that, just one more question. <laughs> okay. uh, I just want to find out regarding your post, uh, your, your stroke, uh, with patient with stroke. Uh, does it matter that if you receive a treatment in the early on, uh, immediately after the stroke? Or, you know, if a patient already had stroke like two years down the line, do you think that you would still be beneficial to receive, uh, you know, plasma conditioning and that you will probably still expect results? Yes, definitely. Because the, I mean, if you look, if, if, you were, if you're just trying to be very critical, uh, the looking at the, what we are doing, basically we, we, are, we are changing the, intravascular volume, the, the, combina the, the proportion of all materials in the intravascular. And the, since vascular, uh, the quality of the intravascular environment is related to all the regenerative procedures and all the circulation and things like that, you, you can name 100 of those effects. So almost everybody, after they got the plasma conditioning session, they immediately feel Relax, or they feel just you know energetic and things like that. The the issue is right now is what you as you're asking about the two years down the road. I think I mean, even for people who never have a stroke, they're going to see, feel the sim, similar improvement. So for people who had had stroke two, two years ago, I mean they still experience you know it's, it's still beneficial to them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, okay. For that, I think we are, we are going to end today's uh, sessions. Thank you, Dr. Penn and uh, all the audience and delegates who uh, make time to attend, make our event today successful. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll end the call today now. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye.